Thank you, uh, uh, Chris. Uh, I will go for Edward, why not? Just to keep the continuity. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Sally Benson and Richard Sassoon to uh, that gives up the opportunity to share with you our, our research work. Um, let me uh, recognize my co-workers, uh, the people on the first row actually are the ones that did the work. Michael Stewart is a postdoc, he's among the audience here carrying the microphone. Um, he, he joined us about, uh, about uh, early this year. David Johnson is, um, uh, is a graduate student in mechanical engineering, he's also in the audience. And uh, I was, I'm pleased to say that, uh, that his poster got the uh, Honorable Mention Award last night, so you can see him as well as his poster out in the lobby. If you're interested, he's, he's mostly involved in the modeling aspect of the work that we are doing, so I'm pleased to, to hear that uh, we got mentioned. And Brandon Long is, a, uh, is also in the audience, sitting there in the back row. Uh, he's a, a graduate student in chemical engineering, uh, who just joined us about five, six months ago. And I also like to recognize, of course, my longtime colleague and collaborator, Professor Reggie Mitchell of Mechanical Engineering, who's actually the, uh, uh, the PI, the official PI on the project, and is sitting right there. So um, without further ado, um, let me say that our, our primary focus uh, is, uh, is uh, utilization and conversion of solid fuels uh, in fuel cells in a more efficient and environmentally friendly manner. And of course, uh, uh, this, pr uh, this uh, um, uh, presents uh, its own challenges, and I'll walk you some, through some, some uh, fuel cell concepts, how we will deal and handle uh, solid fuels in a fuel cell environment, simply because a lot of the uh, conventional fuel cells uh, only handle uh, uh, gaseous fuels, and mostly hydrogen, and maybe uh, a few in, uh, based on, on, on methane and other things. But, but uh, solids, handling solids, or utilization of solids in a fuel cell environment poses its own challenges. And so I will, I will uh, uh, walk you through some of these concepts. And, and of course, conversion into, uh, into electricity directly in a, in, in a single reactor without actually burning them uh, provides major advantages. Uh, the ultimate goal, of course, is to go one step further uh, in this into complexity. And, and deal with and, and convert uh, coal, uh, which presents its own um, a set of challenges above and beyond simple carbon or carbon issues fuels like biomass does. So the, uh, the objective is to, uh, to convert a dirty fuel like coal into something uh, clean like electricity and hydrogen. And that's where the uh, GCEP project uh, comes in and makes it uh, possible for us to explore this particular uh, exciting avenue. So why do we care about coal? Coal is, um, is um, 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 oops, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. Uh, coal is, um, um, is widely used, uh, uh, it provides a lot of the energy uh, uh, globally and about 40% of all the electricity production around the world, partly because it's still a lot cheaper than even natural gas after the uh, 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 shale gas uh, uh, discoveries. And also, it's widely available and abundant uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in the Earth. U.S. has the largest coal reserves, more than a quarter of the, uh, of the world reserves. And most populous countries like China and India, uh, they have a, a large reserves of coal, and they are using this uh, uh, resource for their technological and economic development. In China, about 80% of the electricity is produced from coal. And in India, it's still uh, slightly lower, but still uh, very, very high. Uh, in the United States, um, uh, we're using less of coal, especially after conversion of a lot of the coal-fired plants to natural gas. But still, we're, we're averaging a little lower, lower than 40% of our electricity coming from coal in 2012. That's the latest that I could find from EIA reports which came down from about 45% uh, from, from two years uh, before that, but it's not expected to go much further than that. It's about 37, 38% over the long run in, in the next few decades. And we should, I mean, this trend is, is common to uh, around the world as well, as the world is going to use less in coal in sort of percentage of the share in electricity production. But that's not a very good criteria or the parameter to work on. 
uh, I think we should look at the amount of coal that is actually being used, and the amount of coal is going to increase by 50% between now and uh, 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 2040 or 2050 timeframe. So the amount of coal is, is, the, is, the, is, the, is what's going to uh, uh, be of concern to us. And you see in this graph, although uh, um, a lot of the renewables and natural gas derived uh, uh, power generation has uh, increased, it will be increasing or expected to increase over the years, but still coal will, be, will reign as the, as the uh, dominant force in electricity production. And thinking that, uh, considering that uh, most of the coal-fired plants around the world now operate at around, at the low 30% uh, 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 conversion efficiency, only the new ones uh, that are coming online are about a little over 35%, closer to 50%, depending upon the technology that they adapt. Uh, that's still a very low uh, conversion efficiency in terms of how we utilize it, but more importantly, as we've seen in the, in the previous talks, as well as in some talks in the, uh, um, yesterday, that most of that CO2 that is produced is emitted as a small fraction of the flu stack gas composition. It's only about 10, 15 percent uh, of the flu stack is uh, CO2. Rest of it, or, or, or major part of it, part, portion of it, is, is nitrogen. And it's, we have all seen uh, the, from the previous talks how difficult it is to, to separate CO2, uh, energy intensive and, and costly that is in terms of separation. So there is a, there is a, a real incentive to, to think uh, differently about coal conversion. And of course, uh, uh, the fuel cells, what we call carbon fuel cells, provide a, a, a major opportunity in that direction. Efficiency is, of course, the key. If we can, say, increase the efficiency, um, optimistically, if we double it, then you can do the numbers and, and it provides a, a huge incentive to uh, look into that direction. A carbon fuel cell, this is an idealistic uh, uh, depiction of a carbon fuel cell. What it is is a, uh, we have a, a bed of carbon or coal in the anode compartment. Uh, it's a, this is a fuel cell element. Uh, on the cathode side, we have air. We extract the uh, um, uh, oxygen from the air, oxidize it uh, to make oxide ions. We transport these oxide ions through an electrolyte. And these oxide ions uh, at the anode react with the carbon to form carbon dioxide, releasing their electrons. And those electrons uh, travel through the external circuit uh, to, uh, to produce electricity. And the only reaction product, as you see, is CO2. So uh, this electrolyte could be a ceramic electrolyte. It can be a, a molten carbonate or molten hydroxide or even aqueous electrolyte. Nevertheless, the net reaction that we achieve is nothing different from burning it. Uh, it's carbon plus oxygen going to CO2. Uh, but we do this by extracting electrical work out of that system uh, while they're doing this conversion. And the driving force for this reaction is about a volt. So we get about a volt of open circuit voltage in the, uh, in the fuel cell, which is pretty good. The uh, thermodynamic efficiency, theoretical thermodynamic efficiency, uh, uh, defined by delta G over delta H, where during this reaction, the entropy loss is so small that the theoretical uh, efficiency of, of this conversion is 100%. So what we are gaining is a very, very high ceiling for, for efficiency. Of course, we will have cell losses, the risk of losses, activation losses, and what have you. But, but the ceiling that we're starting out from is very, very high. So, Proportionately, we produce less amount of CO2, but not only that, we produce CO2 as a, as a primary component of our, of our fuel cell. Uh, so we don't have to separate it. Uh, you don't have to go through a post-separation process. You just seen the big real estate and a process plant for capturing uh, CO2 from a coal fire plant. Also, Sally showed that same um, uh, picture from Saskatchewan plant. It's a huge investment and a huge cost to do, to separate CO2. And also uh, bear in mind that you don't see any water involved in, 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 this, in this process. So water is also is a very uh, precious commodity and, and a resource. Uh, just to give you a benchmark, about 40% of freshwater withdrawals in this country uh, is for thermoelectric power generation. So thermoelectric electricity generation uses a lot of water. So there's a large incentive not to get water involved in it. 
And of course, there's no moving parts here. Uh, it operates at constant temperature. It's fuel flexible. Lots of solid fuels that we can, we can use here. And modularity, of course, gives us an opportunity to do this in a distributed manner. But of course, there's a caveat. There are constraints, and major constraints. That's why this is so difficult. One of the major constraints is that we all know electrochemical uh, reactions or charge transfer reaction occurs on discrete sites at the interface. And that interface is usually between the electrode and the electrolyte. And these are atomistic or atomic scale uh, sites that these reactions will, will occur because it has to collect all the participating species that reside in different phases at that interface onto that reaction site. And that's where the problem is because you got a, a boulder of a, a carbon particle which has uh, sizes anywhere from say 50 to uh, 50 microns to, to millimeters in size to be able to uh, make a contact at, uh, at atomic scale contact at an, uh, at an uh, electrode uh, uh, site to, to make this electrochemical reaction happen. So one of the techniques is to, uh, uh, to, to overcome part of this problem is to gasify solid fuel, either using uh, steam uh, for steam gasification, where we uh, 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 react with steam to form hydrogen and, and, and CO, which is a steam gas, and then oxidize this hydrogen and CO, which is uh, through the gas diffusion gets into the electrochemical reaction site at that interface and oxidize. But we are chose to use uh, CO2 as a dry gasification uh, uh, method. CO2 is our anode reaction product, so what we do is, is in a way recycle that reaction product back to our um, um, uh, uh, system, and the CO is oxidized at the electrochemical interface. So that's what uh, happens. Uh, the CO uh, that is formed here is oxidized by the oxygen that's coming through. We have a ceramic electrolyte uh, it stabilized zirconia, which is commonly used in solid oxide fuel cells, and it transports oxide ions through the vacancy uh, mechanism. Uh, the vacancies are formed by uh, extrinsic doping to, to maintain charge neutrality in the, in, the, uh, in the oxide. So oxygen transports uh, through the, uh, through the uh, ceramic material uh, only in the form of, of an uh, ion, right? not in the form of an atom or a uh, molecule. Then uh, this uh, CO2 uh, can react with a nearby carbon in the bed and forming more CO uh, that feeds into the, uh, the anodic reaction. So uh, the shuttle mechanism, if you like, is, is self-feeding and, and uh, provides uh, higher kinetics than, than would normally do. Um, the end of the day, uh, what we, again, is uh, this carbon plus oxygen going to CO, going CO2. Uh, we generate four electrons through the external circuit for every carbon atom that is consumed in the coal bed or in the carbon bed. And we tried many different, uh, we demonstrated this uh, concept, it's a fundamentally sound concept with many different uh, uh, solid fuels. This is uh, for carbon. Uh, we got about uh, close to uh, 220 or, or 30 uh, milliwatts per square centimeter. We did this with various kinds of, of uh, biomass. Uh, this is, uh, these are uh, rice and, and corn stover and, and almond shells and wood and so on and so forth. Uh, we also tried it with, uh, with uh, actual coal, the coal char, uh, which gives us uh, a lot better performance than all the others at about 450 milliwatts per square centimeter. I think this is still uh, is the highest uh, uh, performance uh, based on coal usage in a carbon fuel cell. Now, let me build upon this, uh, this concept. Um, using the same platform, if we just replace the air side or the, on the cathode with steam. So we have carbon on the anode side, we have steam on the, on the uh, uh, cathode side. The oxygen activity difference between the steam and the carbon is a downhill gradient. So it's higher over here than it's over here. So this provides a a thermodynamic driving force of about half a volt or slightly higher than that, depending upon the temperature and the uh, steam hydrogen ratios. Uh, this provides a, uh, a, a driving force downhill for the oxygens to be stripped from the steam, transported through the electrolyte, and be oxidized at the, uh, at the um, um, uh, uh, anode side. And so we're turning a electrolyzer, uh, steam electrolysis requires 
uh, anywhere from 0.9 volts to 1.3 volts, 1.23 volts at room temperature, depending upon the temperature regime. It's a very high barrier um, uh, splitting process. We turn an electrolyzer, which requires electricity to do a chemistry. We turn that into a fuel cell, which produces electricity as well as a, as a fuel. So what we're essentially doing is steam reforming in a fuel cell, but with the, uh, with the uh, carbon stream and the hydrogen stream completely separated uh, from, from, from each other. So there is no mixing, and, and you can use this hydrogen for, for fan fuel cells uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in applications. So we have a carbon, uh, uh, steam carbon cell that produces hydrogen electricity, but requires heat because of the endothermic reaction. We have an air carbon uh, system that produces electricity as well as heat. So the obvious thing is to merge these two together and form a, what we call an ester cell, a steam carbon air fuel cell. And that's where, again, the um, uh, uh, GSEF project comes in to make this uh, happen and, and uh, allow us to, the, the opportunity to explore this exciting uh, direction. So uh, what, what we accomplish here is nothing more than what is being going on in a, uh, a coal gasifier. You supply oxygen to burn part of the coal to uh, derive the energy or the heat to derive the uh, uh, gasification process. And we do, this, uh, we do this in the fuel cell, but achieving uh, electrical work at the same time. So the project program objectives and, and, uh, and tasks, uh, we have uh, multiple uh, 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 items on this. Uh, of course, we're doing cell modeling for predictive studies and, and uh, David's uh, poster uh, yesterday and also still outside is, is uh, focused on this modeling work. If you're interested, you can talk to him. We're, of course, characterizing our solid fuels in terms of their reactivity for, for the Boudoir reaction. Uh, needless to say about the experimental studies, but the two most important parts of the, of the program are the uh, uh, sulfur abatement and uh, catalytic anode development. And in the sulfur abatement, we have a two-pronged approach. We try to develop um, solid sorbents to bring down the sulfur activity to acceptable levels where the anode is going to operate without too much degradation. And of course, at the same time, we like to develop tolerant anodes that would take that uh, level of sulfur and be able to do the job uh, without uh, degradation. So the electrode development is, uh, is going to be an important por portion of this project. Normally, um, uh, nickel, uh, cermet, and, and other metal anodes are, are used in solid oxide fuel cells, but they are not, of course, acceptable in the presence of sulfur. So what we're looking at, perovskites, these uh, materials are, are uh, very versatile and gives us an opportunity to tune ionic and electronic transport properties as well as catalytic activity. And uh, they provide us also with the doping strategies on the A site and the B side, um, where um, you can have multiple dopings, if you like, uh, as long as you uh, maintain uh, or satisfy the Goldschmidt criteria to, uh, uh, to, to maintain the uh, uh, perovskite structure. But it provides a lot of uh, 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 flexibility in terms of tuning properties. And because of the versatility of this, this whole list of very interesting electronic, ionic, uh, and uh, dielectric and catalytic properties that these family of perovskites uh, uh, exhibit, and I won't go into, into but many of them are, are actually uh, in, of industrial uh, interest and, and being used in the technology. So the two uh, uh, family of perovskites that we have identified so far are the titanate base and the vanadate base uh, uh, perovskites. They have not been really explored too much in the catalytic area. And there is some uh, indication in the literature that these uh, perovskites would have some stability against, against sulfur contamination. They have good electronic conductivity. They have uh, reasonably matching um, uh, uh, thermal expansion coefficients. So we are hopeful that uh, uh, these will uh, be a, a step forward in that direction. We already started making and synthesizing these things uh, and, 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 and doping on the A side as well as on the B side. Uh, and characterizing them with uh, XRD and XPS, I'm not go, 
all, over all the details. And we started uh, uh, putting them into cells and making what we call MEAs, the, the membrane electrode assemblies. Here is the uh, yttria doped uh, strontium titanate porous layer. Here is the zirconia electrolyte membrane. Here is the lanthanum strontium manganite uh, cathode layer that uh, we have been able to um, uh, produce. But we are we're still a ways away in terms of actual putting in a cell and actually um, uh, testing it in the presence of coal. So in the, in the sense of uh, the solid sorbent utilization, um, we have identified uh, some of the uh, sorbents that, that make sense from a cost point of view as well as from their efficacy point of view going through some uh, thermodynamic screening, both in the literature as well as ourselves. What we found is that, uh, yes, uh, you know, most of the alkali uh, oxides are effective uh, solid sorbents, but they, the, their utilization is only limited to a very thin skin around the, around the particle because of the diffusion limitations. So the obvious things that people have tried is to uh, disperse them on, uh, on, uh, on uh, inert supports. Uh, what we like to explore is something slightly different. We like to try to uh, disperse them on reactive or consumable supports, like carbon, for instance. In the same manner as, 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 the, as the fuel in our fuel cell, we like to load them onto carbon and, and get the uh, sulfur to levels roughly below 10 ppm or so that we think our, our, uh, our oxide-based anode materials will be stable too. So this is a, uh, uh, the SEM picture of a, uh, of a carbon fiber. We, we chose these uh, fibers so that we could identify and see um, uh, where we are in terms of their loading. It's easier to work with them rather than with powdered uh, carbon or coal. Uh, here is after the impregnation of, uh, of these fibers with the calcium oxide, calcium hydroxide, using a, an ammonia uh, as a dispersion. And you can see both on the surface, these uh, red marks or red coloring is due to the calcium uh, from the uh, backscattered electron image. It, it, both on the surface as well as within the bulk, we have uh, a fair amount of penetration and impregnation of these into the materials. So lastly, um, um, just to summarize uh, the, uh, the modeling results, we have been able to um, uh, uh, it shows that this is a very viable uh, uh, approach to both electricity and hydrogen generation, and you can tune in your um, uh, hydrogen and electricity production demand uh, based on, uh, on, on, on the requirements and, and demand uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the market. And you can, you, do, you can do this in a very, very uh, efficient way. The primary efficiency that uh, we have calculated or ex uh, predicted uh, based on experimental values or experimental data is roughly about 78%, which is the primary efficiency of both conversion into hydrogen as well as into electricity. The electrolyzers, the alkaline electrolyzers for making hydrogen, they operate around 65 to 75%. So they are still efficient uh, and, and comparably efficient, but if you uh, consider the, the round trip efficiency, the primary efficiency where they get their electricity from, if it's coal derived, it's about low 30%, which make the primary efficiency of that electrolyzer around 20% rather than 78%. So um, we are pretty excited about this project. Uh, we haven't made a lot of progress because it's a young one, but uh, we feel that uh, this is going to be a pathway to efficient uh, conversion of, of coal uh, into clean energy uh, of electricity and hydrogen. Uh, we get a, uh, a, we obtain a concentrated stream of CO2. Uh, no post separation is needed. Fuel flexibility and modularity from, especially from uh, distributed generation from local fuels uh, in, in, uh, in Africa or any other parts of the, uh, of the world where power, distributed power is badly needed. This could be a, a, a sort of a model system to, to develop along those directions, provided that, of course, we have, uh, we have overcome and, and solved a lot of the challenges. And there are many. The links to this is very, very long, uh, but they can be addressed by uh, uh, basic research. And some of the things that we are addressing in this, in this pro uh, program will provide uh, insights into, into a few of these uh, challenges mechanistic understanding of the conversion reactions, 
coal, effect of coal contaminants on the, uh, on the performance, as well as other things that we, uh, we will uh, try to address uh, in, during the project. And, and I'll leave you with this, uh, with this message uh, that um, the carbon fuel cells uh, are a viable way of, of uh, going into a transition to a low carbon power generation. And uh, we would like to thank the opportunity for, to be able to do this under GSEP support. So with that, I will conclude and take uh, questions. Thanks, Target. We have about four minutes for questions. Thanks for that presentation, Turgut. It was very, very uh, nice and, and really interesting, the thermodynamics of carbon conversion. Electrochemically, have always been attractive, so it's very neat to see uh, this concept, uh, you know, really being worked on. Um, a couple thoughts occur. Um, certainly, electro-oxidation of CO is, always has higher polarization of hydrogen. Same is true, I guess, in, in one view from combustion reactions, CO is always seems to be the last to the party. Uh, hopefully that, that piece of it can uh, be overcome somewhat. Um, the one, one question I guess to think about is uh, that I'm not quite sure is how you feed the fuel. It seems like it could be batch process. Uh, I'm not quite sure there. And, and the other piece um, would be uh, related to the fact that, okay, yeah, sulfur is clearly important. Uh, it seems like there'll probably be some pre-fuel processing needed seems like there's roughly a quarter of the periodic table seems to be in a lump of coal. Um, so maybe there might be some pre-fuel processing as well. Your thoughts on that? Well, uh, let me first start with the CO. CO is, a, uh, is not a very uh, uh, widely used fuel for, for sol oxide fuel cells or for any, any other fuel cells. And based on the uh, very s uh, small single cell studies, yes, uh, CO has a has a high um, activation barrier versus uh, compared to hydrogen. But in, in big cells that we have measured um, uh, in, in, in sort of pro, pre, prototype cells, the hydrogen and the CO uh, performances in the same cell uh, came about five to 10%. Uh, CO is, is slightly lower than, than hydrogen because when you get into the large systems, you get the resistive losses that dominate more the, uh, the kinetics of it. In the, uh, in the sorbent area, um, we're hoping that in, 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 a, in, a, in a steam rich environment, uh, hydrogen is a very, very powerful uh, gasifier. It reacts with many of the uh, elements that you uh, mentioned in the periodic table forming arsine and phosphine, you know, chlorides and so on and so forth. They're all volatile, so they diffuse and, 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 and land on the anode. In a, in a hydrogen poor environment with a carbon rich environment, we're hoping that the volatility and the, and the gasification of, these, uh, of some of these, uh, uh, you know, like arsine and phosphine, for instance, will be uh, uh, mitigated or, or diminished uh, to a certain extent. And that we will be able to capture some of that with the solid sorbent uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the reactor. Now, this is a tall order, of course, and we, won't, we don't know until we try it whether uh, how much or, or how much progress we will make in that direction. But that's the, that's the, uh, that's the thought. Okay, we have time for one more. Uh, essentially, this, you sort of covered the, uh, uh, the question a little bit, mentioning these other elements, arsine, et cetera. But um, I'm not sure the lack of hydrogen will solve the problem, because in combustion of coal, uh, there are lots of these elements that appear in the normal combustion process in the exhaust. Uh, I'm familiar with catalytic sensors that are used in, in some of these processes for um, uh, CO measurement, and they actually have shown silane poisoning deep in the pores. So you'll have some issues with these kinds of elements, you know, the, half the periodic table is in coal, and I'm sure you're gonna end up with lots of volatile silane uh, um, hydrides that might end up in your... Uh, in, in your uh, you're absolutely system. right, and that's very likely that will happen. Uh, with a slight caveat that the environment in our anode is a reducing environment, whereas in the, in the combustor, of course, it's more, more oxidizing. Uh, so I don't know whether that will make any difference in terms of the uh, gasification rates of these impurities into the gas phase to land on the, on the anode and elsewhere. We will have to see. But, but our for since, since the problem is so complex and so wide in terms of dealing with all the impurities in coal, 
Uh, we selected the, the major one, the sulfur, as being a primary uh, sort of attack point, if you like. And if we can solve the sulfur problem, then hopefully we will have some headway into uh, dealing with the other impurities in time. Great. Thanks very much, Turgut.